Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So uh, let's start. So first of all, uh, we are deep learning sessions Portugal. Uh, we call volunteers and basically to sharing uh, insights about deep learning uh, in Portugal and around the world. And today, together with Axins, we'll have a lecture given by uh, Luis. Uh, this will be a more or less 45 minute talk with a few minutes at the end for uh, questions and answers. Um, Luis is uh, currently a PhD student uh, at the University of Coimbra, and he will talk to us about deep learning aligned with type design. So, Luis, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, for, thank you for the presentation. Uh, as as he said, my name is Luis Gonçalo, I'm a PhD student and I will present uh, my work that was developed at the University of Coimbra uh, together with Jessica Parente, which is also a PhD student, more related with design. So, first of all, uh, I want to, to present some context to, to this presentation that type design is not a thing that is well known uh, specifically using deep learning. So I need to explain why this work emerged and where. So we um, we work in the CDD lab, which is computational and uh, design and visualization, which focus on the creation of visual artifacts with uh, using generative algorithms, using artificial intelligence, or visualization of information for, for example, we work with Sonai, we work with uh, <laughs> multiple companies in Portugal to have a more visually aesthetic visualization of data, not only uh, lines and lines of numbers, but as some part of visual um, aesthetic part of the visualization. So, um, as I said, we work at the Computational Design and Visualization Lab. We have uh, a lot of different backgrounds. We have, for example, computer science as myself. Uh, we have, for example, Jessica Parent, which is a graphic designer, but we have multiple uh, backgrounds such as biologists, as mathematicians uh, that work together to, in, this, in this laboratory. So, uh, as I said, uh, we mainly focus on the development of many visual, it has a, a small delay. We work, for example, in the development of posters, for example. Um, in this case, which the, the, the author is present in the, in the meeting, but he use, uses evolutionary computation to evolve this type of reactive posters that extract information from the people that is, are visualizing the posters to create different posters for different people. Something more personally uh, aligned with each one. Uh, more aligned with typography, we have some works, for example, in this one that uses um, evolutionary computation to evolve uh, strokes to create new letters or new types that are recognized as letters, um, as we all know. Um, something more experimental. We have also, for example, this work, which uses a combination of uh, evolutionary algorithms with neural networks that try to experiment new letters, but, but uses machine learning uh, uses um, a classifier to maintain the aspect of the, the letter or more or less uh, similar to the existing letters. And we create these visual different uh, letters, for example, these ones. Uh, another work which was actually developed by Jessica Parent, uh, which combined different parts of different letters uh, and together with, again, uh, an evolutionary uh, algorithm, it, the person can select which one he likes the most and it evolves to match the preference of the user of, of this tool. So, this is all the work that we developed. It's 
uh, a lot of things, but I'm here to present a specific work that we developed last year. So we have kind of the motivation why we are doing this, this in this lab, why we are working with type design. So now why specifically this work behind what what's the, the motive behind our work. So first of all, type design is a, a very complex and uh, sorry. it's a very consu time consuming and complex work that needs a lot of time to, to master the technique. So uh, in a way, we are trying to simplify this work. It's not easy to simplify because it's a very, very complex job, but in a way we are trying to, to simplify. So it requires many years of experience to develop something like this. First, we design just the font. Then we, we need to, to draw each, each letter with big precision. So usually we work with uh, software specifically for that work, for that job. So it, we need to change all these parameters or all, all these points to create something that must be perfect. The, the curves must be perfect. And in, in the end, it must uh, arise something that makes the text look good and not only uh, beautiful letters because we need to balance the, the two things. So, for example, we want the designer want to wants to draw or wants to design a letter. In order to look like this, it needs to have all these points that need to be manually adjusted to to match uh, the drawing we want. So, but when we when the designer do this letter, he also needs more letters. But what is the issue here? They have they need to have similar parts because altogether they represent a single font. So they have all to be very similar. For example, the, the serif part of the letter, but also the the, the rest of the letter must have similar uh, width to match which one in this case and also in the, the smaller ones. So, and this is only for the letter A. We have to do the same thing for the letter B, drawing all the points again. And this, sorry, there's a, okay. We need to do all this for all the letters of the alphabet in the upper case, in the lower case, and then in all the symbols. So this, at this point, this can be very exhausting, very uh, tiring. So that's why we are trying to use, take advantage of machine learning. Why? Because we have a lot of existing fonts, so we can create a large data set. Um, and we want to overcome uh, laborious work levers and complex work. So I think this, we thought, okay, this is the point, this is a perfect example to use machine learning. So that's why we, we started to do. But first, also some, some context um, to explain some decisions we made to accomplish the work we, done, we have done. So first of all, um, ma many, some years ago, some people also, also thought what we thought. So they started to use GANs to generate uh, some new fonts. They have large data sets, so they create a lot of pixel images, and put them into a GAN, and they did some fonts, some, some good examples, as we see. Uh, the only issue is it's this one. GANs have some limitations that uh, may not be able to overcome. So this is the main issue that, for example, if we take a large text, if we apply that kind of, that 
kind of uh, generated font, it can look something like this, which is not re readable, so it's not usable. The font we generated is not usable for the the, um, the context we want. So just a small break. So, what is the, the solution to this? The solution is, okay, sorry. My friendship ended with pixels. Now, SVG is my best friend. So, what is, does this mean? The, the, the community started to look into SVG because it does not contain the problems that were uh, present in the games and they, can easily work with text and it might, might solve all the issues we have until now. So, for example, the, in this work, they use a simple autoencoder, which then also use an SVG decoder that tries to um, replicate the original image using SVG commands. It's more or less okay, but as you can see, the results are interesting, but not on the points that we wanted. On one thing, so some more experimentations. This is uh, an uh, interesting work where the, they use an, a sketch RNN and a GPT-2 to generate the, the directly the SVG commands. What is the issue here? First, in the sketch RNN, the results are visually appealing, but they do not uh, work well in large text because some are uh, overdone, some are cut off, so this is an issue. In the second part, the GPT-2, uh, the, the results are also very interesting, but as the also, also, sorry, author mentioned, only one in every uh, 100 results generated a valid in our work we okay in our work we want to try different want to use the skeleton of the font. Why, why is that? Because first of all, it neglects, it removes all the flourishing that fonts might have. We have seen, for example, in the title of my presentation, that have some parts that are irrelevant for the, for the machine learning process to work well. We use the outline, these parts also count and may um, the, the results we obtain. So if we work with the skeleton part of the, the letter, it is the structural part of, of the, the letter, so it might work better because there are more, uh, the skeleton part is more uh, similar between each other and does not In the end, what we want to do is take advantage of machine learning using a factor-based approach, because as I mentioned, it works very well uh, with fonts and does not contain the limitations games, for example, have, and also work with the skeleton-based approach because it, it works directly with the structure of the letter and it allows the typographer to fill the letter as it wants to and, and so it can create a more diverse type of letters without uh, having the, the, the job of the work to do all that manually. So in the end uh, we want to create, uh, uh, in, as we work in the, in the 
Okay, this, this is kind of different because as we work, I don't want to, the major point is not to come with the, the best solution in machine learning with the best networks. We want the issue, the, the thing that we are trying to resolve is to create design artifacts for designers to work with. So we are not trying to solve the, the world's problem. We are just trying to create the design artifacts or uh, simplify the work to, to get the design artifacts, in this case, letters. So with all this in mind, finally we get to the point uh, and we uh, I will present the a paper we we wrote written for Evostar, uh, where we propose an autoregressive model that creates glyph skeletons by interpolating between existing ones. So why is that? Because we take advantage of um, because the knowledge that typographers need to have is already in that in that uh, files in the fonts they exist the existing fonts sorry and we just interpolate between existing ones so we create new ones based on the knowledge that already is in that so for the data set as i said there are a lot right now there are a lot of data sets from of fonts but we use google fonts which contains a large quantity of of letters of fonts that are divided in three cat uh, five categories serifs and serifs monospace display and then writing we then remove these two types because they are mainly um, they are very distinct from the rest uh, so which is not desirable for our approach so we remove that two classes which gave um, 2600 fonts in TTF form, which is a common format for, for this type of files. <coughs> we only worked with 26 characters of the Latin alphabet in their capital form, so we only work with capitals, and in the end we have the collection of 68,000 glyphs to work with for our data set. It's not a lot, but for our simple approach, it worked well, in my opinion. Uh, to create the, the data set, we, uh, we created, uh, we took the input glyph, used a tool to extract the skeleton of the font, which gave a list of ordinate, ordinate points coordinates and stroke width. So we can trade the network with the point, the with the points, and then we convert again only the skeleton to the to the model input in the binary, in the black and white 64 for 64 pixel image. Then the architecture of the network. We use a conditional variational autoencoder, and I will explain why. So we took the input image, we sell you uh, encoding to specify which letter we are using, and then we employ a set of convolutional neural networks that process the image as the encoder and encodes them into a set of means and standard deviations. Why is that? Because if we why we use a variational autoencoder because if we want to interpolate between the existing points of the Latin space, this works well, um, and autoencoders does not work so well in, in this in this part. Um, in this part, so then uh, we create the z vector based on the means and standard deviations. We apply again the image decoder and set again the, the input class to the decoder and it tries uh, and sorry, it tries to reconstruct the original image 
And we also have, which is the most important part, a sketch decoder, which tries, which tried to output a list of 30 points that recreate uh, that is, so, okay, I thought it was in here. So it try, it is, um, this image, these points are rasterized and compared with the original input. So the loss function for this uh, network. First, as basically a binary cross entropy between the input image and the output image of the image decoder. Then, as I said, we take the results of the sketch decoder and rasterize it using a differentiable vector graphics library to produce a black and white image, which is then compared with the original input using, again, the binary cross entropy. In the end, uh, as a variational autoencoder, we calculate uh, the callback leeward divergence to encourage the okay to encourage the learning latent space to follow a Gaussian distribution. So to again interpolate better in the latent space. Which I don't I don't completely uh, I don't completely understand what the the deviations do to the output. How is it better with the deviations than without them? Devi sorry, in this point? Uh, yes. Uh, so, if um, okay, if we have if the distribution of the input is in a Gaussian distribution instead of a single point, when we interpolate the la the the latent space is regularized, so we can more easily uh, take small steps in the learn latent space instead of if we use a single point that space between the, the two points can not be uh, and I don't want to say existing but it's not does not construct so so much sorry it does not construct a, a good output because there is nothing there and if you use a Gaussian distribution we kind of uh, have something there I'm not explaining well Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. Um, can I can I answer your question later in the end? Yeah, sure. Sorry, it, it, it's better for me to explain person to person. Okay. Yeah. In Portuguese. Huh? In Portuguese. I don't think it. You don't speak. I speak Portuguese. Yeah, yeah. Ah, you speak Portuguese. Portuguese. Okay. <laughs> it's much better. Sorry, I, I will explain in the end. Okay. Yeah, no worries. At all. Okay. Thank. You. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, to just to, to complete this part, the loss function then is calculated as a sum of the three different parts: the binary cross entropy between the input and output image, between the input image and the rasterized output sketch, and the callback labeler divergence. Now to the good part, the results. So the, the autoencoder and the sketch decoder, okay, is, this is more or less irrelevant, but we train for 50 epochs, learning rate of one elevated to minus three, at the size of uh, 260, uh, 256. But first about the reconstruction of the scale, okay. As, we, as, as I mentioned before, um, the, the model returns a sequence of points uh, when connected, create the skeleton of the, the letter. So we can compare, it's more or less very similar to the input image. These are the input, this is the reconstruction. So it's more or less similar. In most cases, uh, the, the in most of the cases, the, the generated skeletons are reconstruct, reconstructed, uh, work very well, uh, can, are able to reconstruct the basic features of the skeleton. In some cases, 
some interesting cases is, for example, the X, as we work only one uh, with one single line, it needs to overlap itself to reconstruct this structure. So it's working, I think, in my opinion, it's working well because it, uh, some cases like this emerge with which I second uh, the, the representation of the latent space to know if sorry to know if the to identify the style and make it uh, the latent space and interpretable so I think this is very small when it okay I'm not sure if you can see, but basically this, uh, the letters, we can see that they are more or less um, together, the, the similar letters, so it's work more or less okay. Um, we can see, for example, the T and the Y are very close because they have a lot of similarities between each other, so they are separated in a different, in the kind of, a Okay. Okay, this is zoomed in, but as you can see, the they are more or less similar, so they are placed together. We have other cases, for example, the P and the B, which have like that vowel, so they are also in the similar, uh, in the same place. Okay, a zoomed in version. And we also uh, created a similar visualization for uh, using the, uh, by inputting a single um, class. So, we can see that for a single letter, the, the styles are also more or less separated uh, between different styles and the similar styles are um, related. For example, in this case, they, uh, the model was able to separate the different weights, the different widths. For example, we have a more or less condensed letter in so yeah, zoom in. Uh, in the opposite, sorry, I'm not used to to this delay. So okay, as you can see, so this part is here. The more uh, the more thin ones are in here. So we kind of see the, this. Uh, we also have a part where the series are okay, zoomed in. We have like that part in the, oh, sorry. Uh, we have the year, the italic ones. Okay, we, they, they are also, they are all tilted. And for example, in this one, they, the series are in this part. So the model more or less is able to separate the, the the styles in the latent space. So I I think uh, as we can the the local changes within these regions are also feasible. So for example, where the font the font width increases from the top left to the bottom right. Okay, this is this part is the most thin one, and this part are the most large one. So it's working well. Now, the, the thing that we wanted to, to explore in this paper, which is the interpolation between the existing skeletons. So uh, we explore, uh, we first use some reconstructed skeletons. Okay, we have a, a, width, a large width here, small width here, and we encode this uh, these letters and we generate interpolations between 
them and and as we can see it's more or less okay we we see in this case it's not very visible but in this one we can see the small steps that are being taken to to go from one style to another uh, in the opposite end so uh, <clears throat> in this case not only the width of the letter is being changed but also the height of the letter is also being adapted to each in each point but for example we have a small animation where we interpolate between different letters and as we can see we don't have any uh, anything very weird between the, the different skeletons just take a small video So uh, <clears throat> with this, we also try to explore uh, interpolation between different letters because th this was not the point. But why not? We have done all the, the work until here, uh, until here. So why not also explore this? And as we can see, uh, okay, as we can see. In this case, there are something, some things that occur that are not uh, are not letters as we know it. But as we can see, it, also, it is also possible to interpolate between different letters and different styles uh, using our model. So, for example, in this case, it, it kind of uh, when we go from L to G, we kind of uh, end up in C probably. So, something very interesting is the case for the Z and the T that it, it, the, the bottom the bottom leg needs to retract to uh, generate the T as as we know it. Okay. So now the part um, that we also want to give the designers the possibility to do. Okay, we have skeletons, but how we transform from skeletons into using usable letters as we know it. So we need to fill the letters, uh, fill the skeletons that we generate. So uh, as I mentioned before, something very important is that the tool that we use to extract the skeleton not only extracts the point coordinates but also the stroke width so at each point of the letter we know the width of in that point to that is used to for the original letter so if we can if we can interpolate between the existing um, between the existing uh, skeletons, we also can interpolate the width of the letter. So that's so what we did was at each point we know the width. We, if we use, for example, fifty percent, fifty percent of this skeleton, also fifty percent of this skeleton. So the width will be something more or less like the mean of the both, both widths. Width. So that's what we did. Then just a, another interpolation between to complete the filling. And we now have uh, an usable letter that we can use for multiple purposes. This is our work. Um, <laughs> It is what it is. Uh, now, this part, this is uh, not my part because I, I work with machine learning, so 
I did this with some help. This is the part that the designer enters. And okay, we have this. How can we apply to real world domain, um, real applications? Uh, so, for example, in the first application, we did something like this, which is a small animation that's similar to the, the previous one, but this can create the the input glyphs are in red and light blue, and the dark blue is the one that is being changed over the time. So we can create something more aesthetically, aesthetically uh, diverse and interesting. At, they are, as I said, more interesting at the visual level and enable a design of um, design of uh, dynamic visual identities, for example. If we have someone with the name F and A, we can do something like this and the letter changes as the, the person that is giving the cards change, something like this. We can create, for, for example, they are all different because we can interpolate the steps we want and we can play with this. Um, for example, we can also create bags that work well, t-shirts, <laughs> and as I said, for example, if, if we have Charles Parker, we can create something with the C and the P because we know that our model is able to interpolate between these two different letters. In the second application, uh, we eventually will come. Uh, so we have the points, we calculated, we set uh, lines, okay, uh, based on the distance to the different point, to the next point, and we can create something like this with uh, small, easy steps. We can create different feelings that have, uh, it's, further away from the traditional typography as we know it, but it's interesting results. And as we can see, we can uh, we are also doing, again, the, the interpolation between the different skeletons and it produces these results. This can be used, for example, as uh, <laughs> one example, for example, um, as a, a book cover, we can create something more or less like this, which is different from what we are used to, to see, but it, it, can, it is very interesting and we don't need to have uh, in, in kind of and come with interesting results that can be used uh, in different domain scenarios and without much work. Thank you. This is my presentation. Uh, I'm not, I might not be clear, but you can use this QR code to go to the, the post of the, the work in our website of computational design and visualization lab. And again, this is my work and Jessica Parent, which was presented a few months ago. So I hope you like it. It's not much, but it's honest work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will answer your in Portuguese if, if it's possible. Questions? I have one. Okay. So, uh, suppose that you want to design the entire alphabet, so the letters from A to Z. Do you have at the moment a way to ensure that the letters between themselves look consistent? 
So, for example, can I, uh, like you mentioned, create an interpolation vector and depart from an existing alphabet and interpolate according to that same vector for all letters? And will that give me a consistent look for the new alphabet? Okay, yeah. I understand your question. It's very interesting. We thought of that after we done the work. But it's something to consider. Yeah, we kind of have a style vector and maintain the style vector across different letters. It's not, uh, right now it's not implemented, but uh, I tend to, to work to make it work. Okay, because there are a few works that use that and only after the work was done, the, the paper was submitted, it's okay, this is, was a good idea, maybe, because uh, th this is a small explanation, a uh, simple explanation why it's not done, because uh, the, the original idea used a single model for a single letter, so that was not the, we did not, we were not able to implement that if we uh, maintain that idea, but, uh, but then we, I thought, okay, this can be done with a single model because if we have, uh, if we want to work with all the letters, that the, it can be com uh, very difficult to work. But then I changed the, the architecture to work with one model for all the letters. And uh, that's why I did not do that because I did not have to, to them before, so when I changed the network, I did not stop to, to implement that. Okay. I, if I can come into mm -hmm. this, was the personal version of the system, so mm -hmm. I guess that part of that was was trying to explore the most, most possibilities available, so kind of create. Let me let me. Uh, Pick a random skeleton of a random letter, and then think think about uh, putting together to another that we are not thinking about this this one this this two doesn't match. So let's let's try to create the most uh, different versions because let's see if the system can create kind of these 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 letters that we don't think that we will work uh, in the in the beginning. So right now let's. We, we, we just experiment and, and then create uh, different letters and now let's <laughs> let's think about all these 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 these, these things that that uh, that are the most important that we think in the in the beginning but when, when we um, uh, create the system it, it was not possible and now let's think about all that steps and create kind of italics and create bold ones and create the, the, the not only the capital letters because there are so much more so like uh, we said we are just beginning and now this this all these questions that that you ask and all it, it, it's a work in progress yes <laughs> basically this, is, this was kind of a version 1.1 because the Version one was a single model. This one point one, that might be the version one point two. Okay, thank you. More questions? No. Uh, yes, I have a question as well. Um, about the morphy, I mean, uh, the, the, the interpolation between uh, two different letters and the change between uh, those two. Uh, how does the skeleton uh, react? I mean, uh, does it stretches? Does it become? I mean, because you 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 showed before there are points that mm -hmm. form. I mean, there are several points in the skeleton. Yes. So is the skeleton the same one for every kind of letter? So in terms of uh, uh, points, or actually it changed, and it can became mm -hmm. like uh, uh, shorter or bigger mm -hmm. or, yeah. or or longer or adding points. Uh, okay. First, the, the number of points we use is fixed. Okay. So the, this, um, the, the, second, the second question, more or less, um, it kind of, I, I don't want to, to be honest, but it kind of works like a black box. Okay. We know that it works. Okay. For example, if 
for example, in the T, uh, we have, it might be, for example, we have the, the or vertical part, horizontal part. It can be doing something like this. It can be the opposite way. It can have one point here and the rest is up here. We don't know. The, the thing is, it works, but we don't go to each letter to understand why it's done that way. It was done that way. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it was your question, but it kind of is a black box to know how it works. But because, uh, as I said, for example, in the case of the, the X, we were not expecting to work. We don't know which path it do to complete the letter. And if for, for different axes, it, it, do, it does um, a different path or all the same, we, we don't know that. Because um, it, it, was, it would be a complex work to analyze each one because they are 2800 and it's a complex work. But um, I, I know it works, okay, but I, I'm not very familiar how does it how it is able to do that okay i, I cannot answer further than this in the context of typography uh, if you wanted to uh, improve the, the accuracy of the model how do you uh, what would be your approach okay um for the, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, expanded data set. It is a very small data set. Um, we, it, it's, it, it's kind of is hard to, to create data sets uh, big enough to train large uh, machine learning models because there are, there are a lot of fonts, but there is not a single uh, can I, a standardized way to develop these fonts. So we cannot easily make scripts to extract or extract the fonts and uh, apply them and make the machine work. Okay. There are fonts there. They, some are paid, some are not. Uh, some are only available in some, some type of some country. So the first thing was to um, to um, sorry to expand the data set. The second thing, uh, which I, I, I'm not sure it's, if it will answer your question, but uh, my idea is this in this work the next step that is being developed is use the type of architecture. We are now trying to use diffusion models because they are kind of for image generation uh, and right now sometimes um, vector generation so we are kind of getting the feeds on the water in diffusion models to to replace our our network that answers my, my question thank you Luis. okay thank you for your question more questions no hey, Luis, can i can i make a question remotely yeah sure can you hear me? Cool. Okay, so first of yes, all, yes. for your presentation. Um, so actually, it's more than one question. So basically, uh, you started by stating that you were going to take an auto regressive approach, but then you apply VAE. So I got a bit confused at that point. Uh, did I got it wrong or? So, sorry, uh, can you repeat? I did not understand it very well, sorry. So basically, at the beginning, I guess you stated that you were going to take an autoregressive approach or algorithm, mm -hmm. but then you uh -oh. applied VAE. So my my question is if I got it wrong or if I misunderstood something. No, no, no. Uh, you got it right. Uh, maybe can I just kind of skip to the these parts? Okay. The thing is, we are doing. You are the the part from uh, in the upper part of the, the architecture is a common uh, variational autoencoder, 
but we also implemented a sketch decoder that uses a, regress a regressive neural network to um, take the Z value, the Z vector, and, and output a set of points to reconstruct the skeleton. W was that your question? Uh, I'm not getting why is it autoregressive in the sense that you're not like using the previous output as your new input to pre pre to generate a new output, you see? Uh, we try to use a network by without uh, being autoregressive. The results were not uh, very well. The, the were not very good. Uh, so we tried to use an autoregressive model and it works uh, okay. So we kind of went that way. You mean like the architecture used in the sketch decoder is some kind of auto regressive thing? Yes, yes. Okay, now I got it, sorry. Okay, and you like the 30 that you used for the amount of points outputted by that uh, auto regressive net uh, is just uh, an hyperparameter that you set uh, as fixed and that's it? Yes, Was yes. It? Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, I uh, think it's 50 points, I think. Single okay, hand. okay. I think it's 50 points. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, I, I did not explain why the 50 points in the presentation, but if you want, you can uh, go to the, um, the website and it, it is explained there. But it was more or less a trade-off between um, the detail uh, having detail without losing uh, without losing accuracy. So if we increase the, the number of points, we might lose accuracy, but if, if we decrease uh, the number of points, we might lose details in the skeletons. So it was uh, more or less a trade-off that we experimented and come up with that magical number, more or less. Okay, I think it's kind of an, uh, an hyperparameter tuning, right? Um, yes, yes, yeah. Cool. Uh, then, uh, I'm not sure if I lost it at some point, but I wanted to check how do you measure the performance of your models. Or, like, I, I don't mean the, the losses that you use to train your model, but, like, at the inference time, how do you compare it to other models or something like that? Or you just didn't and you accept your uh, results directly for the design artifact? Like for instance, uh, if you're now going to apply a diffusion model on that, how would you how would you compare it uh, to the VAE? You see? Okay, uh, I do. A... <laughs> that's a nice, that's a very interesting question. Um... <laughs> do I answer that? Suggestions? No. <laughs> um, okay, we. I, I, I'm, I must be honest, because we are not, um, I, I did not think of that, okay, mm -hmm. I, yeah. might be, uh, I must be honest, the, usually the comparison is made, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, um, we, we don't have, um, uh, okay, the, the, the part that I'm develop, developing right now, it's not uh, finished. And when it's finished, uh, I might think of something to compare with these results. But uh, right now, I don't have anything to compare. And we trained the network uh, a single time. We watched the laws, how it, um, how it uh, behaves, and we, we kind of... It's try and error, more or less, um, and yeah. watch the results. And the next approach, we need to think something to compare um, with with yeah, this approach. Yeah, I was just asking because typically it's a bottleneck in this type of application of generative models to new domains. Because if you go to normal images, there are lots of tools already out there. But if you start going into like specific domains, 
things can get. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Um, one one thing. Um, my PhD uh, is kind of takes a, a small step towards that direction because we, as we know it, uh, as you said, there are a lot of tools to compare pixel-based image. Uh, vector base is not so many so so explored so kind of my phd is kind of create some metric to 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 measure to measure um, the measure measure vector based approaches it's I, i'm i'm not sure how i will um, handle that so i cannot go further than this but it's kind of something that I want to explore in the future. Yeah, if you could create some uh, fresh uh, inception distances for typography, I think it would be cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Thank you for the feedback and uh, congrats for the very cool presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you.